The man, the myth, the absolute legend. It can only be the majestic Sephiroth. With Rebirth on the horizon, we're about to see Sephiroth's second, no, actually maybe third coming, and we're gonna see the reason why Sephiroth is the most powerful villain in Final Fantasy VII. In an interview a few months ago, producer Yoshinori Kitase had this to say when he remembered the inception of Sephiroth. Within the Final Fantasy VII universe, there is no one better than Sephiroth. He will always be the strongest, the most powerful, and the most evil there is. And I get that. He was stated officially to be fully in control all along, so it wasn't just general. I mean, it was Genova Roth, you could say. Director Naomi Hamaguchi had this to say about the famous scene of Sephiroth burning Nibelheim down into flames. Quote, even knowing what happens, when I was working on that part, it really impacted me. I wouldn't go as far as to say that I sided with Sephiroth, but I empathized with him. You understand much better why he made that decision, and I think that when people see it, they will love Sephiroth even more. Perfectly understandable. He wasn't a bad guy when he was a former soldier and part of Shinra's military, mentor to Zack, and idolized by Cloud, and the, and the reason Cloud wanted to be in Soldier. But when Sephiroth found out that he was the descendant of an alien uncovered 2,000 years in the past, well, it would be enough to make anyone flip. He knew he was special, sure, but it being the result of Shinra's experimentation and not telling him the truth, he thought he was this great soldier because, well, he was gifted. Not to take that away from him, but it's really because he was directly injected in the womb with an alien's cells. A telepathic, parasitic alien, no less. So he starts reading about his origins in the Shinra Manor in the basement in Cloud's hometown of Nibelheim for days, and he doesn't come out for quite some time. And his base is to start to look down on humans and basically just snap and murder the townspeople People, except for Cloud, Tifa, and Zack, was on the basis of him thinking that he was a Cetra. That was the interpretation of the texts he had read because, well, they were calling Genova an ancient. And because, if you remember the story of FF7, she gets discovered in the northern crater and she's uncovered there by Shinra. And so they think because she's 2,000 years old, this must be the body of an ancient. And so that's what they put in their findings. And this is the information that Sephiroth was in taking during that time period when he was in shock. So of course he thought, okay, now that they're basically just humans walking around and no more ancients, that they essentially made sure that my mother and those like her were eradicated. I mean, how would that make you feel? How would that make any of us feel? So after that, what occurs is, of course, Cloud, the lowly grunt, uh, gathers the strength to toss Sephiroth into the live stream. And luckily, Sephiroth is holding on to Mother's head. <laughs> and then, as a result of that, he travels into the live stream because, of course, he doesn't become one with a live stream. So, what are now known as the modern day humans of Final Fantasy VII, they are the part of the Setra that they didn't want to be nomadic anymore. And so, as a result of that, they settled. They somehow lost their connection with the planet, they lost their ability to speak with the planet. These are the people that are now alive and the people that are like Aerith. They're all but extinct because Genova wiped them out. Mostly, of course. We have Aerith, but yeah, she's the last one and she's a halfling. Why does he not get absorbed? Because, of course, his will is too strong. His spirit is too strong. So instead, he spends years traveling through it and learning the origins of the Setra and what really happened during the battle for the planet all those years ago. According to the Final Fantasy VII Ultimania Omega, quote, as for Sephiroth's true self, when he fell inside the Nibel Maka reactor, he dissolved in the live stream. But over the course of five years, his body reconstructed itself in the northern crater where the live stream concentrates as he bided his time for his revival. Before long, he was able to call Cloud, the copies, and Genova's body together to unify in the reunion and use them to obtain the black materia to summon Meteor. After that, it was the complete body that Cloud and company would fight against. So because of the power of the live stream that has flowed through the planet from inception to oblivion in the world of FF7, it's clear that Sephiroth gains tremendous power. It's also thanks to his quote-unquote mother, Genova, that he has these telepathic abilities as well to conjure up illusions that are so powerful. They get 
give Cloud and Co. quite a scare. So it makes you think, how can Sephiroth, if he is not in some way, shape, or form multi-dimensional, how can he conjure up full-on supernovas or whole other realities that Cloud and Co. fight through in a remake? He's arguably controlling tortured souls of the live stream, aka what are known as the Whispers of Fate, the Arbiters of Fate, trying to use them in his plans. Now, in the portion of the On the Way to a Smile novel, called Livestream Black and Livestream White, written by Kazushige Nojima, the writer of FF7, details how Sephiroth, after he's defeated in the original game, basically clings onto his hatred for Cloud because he doesn't want to lose his sense of self. His ego, his will again, is so strong and clinging so much to that idea of what his identity was on Earth, or the Earth that we know in FF7, that he'll, he'll do anything to preserve that that ego, that id, he just clings onto that hatred for Cloud, that negativity. Thus, the negative live stream goes all around the planet as Meteor is being fought. It's spreading around the planet and it's infecting people with this plague called Geostigma. And Geostigma really makes you think because if the whispers are connected to all the threads of time and space that shape the planet's fate, right? They're timeless. There could be a possibility that these whispers, these arbiters of fate, have also been infected by Sephiroth because, again, the time and space that we know of is occurring concurrently or all at once. So maybe there is a possibility also that ergo Sephiroth can exist all at once in various times and places. And how can a different version of Sephiroth, how can he transport Cloud to what is known in the ending of Remake as the edge of creation? The nebula that we see in the background looks an awful lot like Sephiroth in his safer Sephiroth form. You know, does that ring a bell? The wing and everything? And this is after the party goes through the singularity which is where they fought the Whispers and somehow overcame their fates. But hey, what? wait, what is a singularity really? Hell, scientists barely know in the real world. So to get a little quantum physics on ya, singularities are points that, when mathematically described, give an infinite value and suggest areas of the universe where the laws of physics would cease to exist, i.e. points at the beginning of the universe and at the center of black holes, so they're near a wormhole, which can swallow up entire universes, or become a portal to a whole nother universe, so maybe Maybe it's not a timeline, maybe it's a, it's another universe, or maybe maybe that's the same thing. The Final Fantasy VII Remake Material Ultimania does describe the party's experiences in this space as the world of Lifestream, as represented by Aerith, versus the world of Meteor, as represented by Sephiroth. So the world of Meteor is metaphorical and literal as well. Sephiroth wants his own hell to come true, because Sephiroth wants to cause death to all living things. Aerith and Sephiroth were battling for dominance here in this moment because the party does enter the world beyond through a portal that Sephiroth has made. First it's dark but then Aerith makes it glow white with her powers and then you know everyone steps through it. So what is going on here? I know that the planet has its own power source, the souls that cycle through the planet, but does Genova have something to do with these crazy ass powers as well? I mean she did come on a meteor and crash landed into the planet and caused the giant crater, also known as the Northern Crater, she came with telepathic abilities. And if you're into aliens, you know that in the real world, quote unquote, there is an idea that they are interdimensional beings. Maybe Genova is somehow like that. There's something so insidious about an alien preying on your memories and infecting you with the disease and tricking you with forms and images of your loved ones. There's something so manipulative about that and yet Genova just acts on instinct. It doesn't have a why. And after it kills off the whole planet, it uses the planet's remains as a vessel to go and seek other planets to destroy. I mean, this is crazy stuff and I feel like they should definitely explore this concept more in Rebirth and the third part. I really do believe that something extraterrestrial having telepathic abilities and being that much stronger than the humans and the 
on the planet. It tells me that this parasitic entity really does operate on a higher plane than most, albeit not that high up. It's still something that should be considered. Combined with Sephiroth's already strong will and his genetic material from this alien, and combined with the fact that he's fallen into the live stream and then use that as a conduit to more of his powers, I think we need further explanation on what Genova is, where it comes from, how it became so powerful, how it found Final Fantasy VII's planet. I mean, there's so much they could do with this. And speaking on the recurring theme of memories and feeding upon memories and Sephiroth saying, I will never be a memory in Advent Children, the fact that, again, Sephiroth has Genova cells and he's infected the live stream to such a point where he causes physical incarnations of his will to manifest thanks to the corrupted live stream really makes you wonder memories or forms of thought. Oh, thought. That's it. Telepathy. Okay, now I'm understanding more. Thoughts really are powerful, and that's why thoughts are food to this thing. Thoughts and memories really do influence a whole being. Your memory can be altered to forget the past. Like what happened with Cloud when he had his memory loss and also what apparently happened when Cloud and Co. defeat the Whispers during Remake's ending. They apparently alter fate. So in Final Fantasy VII, there's a big emphasis on memory and what it can do and the planet's memory, the planet's will, what the planet's souls, what the Arbiters think about all this. Maybe the Arbiters of Fate are a conglomeration of all of the memories of the souls of the Cetra and the humans, anyone that has passed away on this planet whose soul has been recycled in the circle of life, again connecting to the theme of rebirth and, and death, because death truly isn't the end. And indeed, this theme of physical death not being the end of this life is a belief that is reflected in Buddhism in our world because Buddhists do recognize that there is a continuous cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Japanese people are heavily influenced by Buddhism. The cycle is known as samsara. The ultimate aim of Buddhist practice is to become free of this cycle. So make of that what you will. Because it, it does raise the question of, can Sephiroth ever stop being reincarnated? I mean, forget if he's multi-dimensional or not. Can we stop him? Can we stop him from manifesting and torturing Cloud? I guess not until Cloud dies can we stop this cycle. But also, is Genova really just parasitic? Or is she a soul harvester that just wants to continuously harvest all of the human souls and the life on these different planets and just feed them to her race. Not that this is probably gonna go there, but that's where my thoughts are going. I think Sephiroth and by proxy Genova are a lot more powerful than the developers really let on. I mean, we know Sephiroth is supposed to be the ultimate evil in that universe. <laughs> I would really like to see more of the why, and I think he's never been more overpowered than now, whether that means live stream travel, multiple manifestations of different Sephiroths, whatever that means, I'm very much looking forward to finding out. And if you ordered the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth Collector's Edition, you know that it comes with a pretty sweet Sephiroth statue, so better get it while it's hot. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed, and till next time. Tana Greek Nose, over and out.